Oh, yes, guys. Welcome back to another call-in show, USMNT call-in show. We got lots to talk about today. I have some things I want to talk about before we get to the call-in show. But the link to the call-in show is over there at the top. I've pinned it to the top, so get in there. Guys who were here last week who I didn't get to, get back in. Um, I think President Chip is helping to run things, right, buddy? You're going to help make sure those guys get in first. Not the greatest weekend overall for compared to some of the recent ones. These last two, since the last camp, to be honest, it hasn't been great. But we'll talk a little bit about that. There's highs and there's lows, and we got to find some equilibrium and not live or die by weekend performances of our boys. But how are you guys doing? How's your weekend been? Uh, anybody got Halloween parties to attend? Halloween plants VMR 209? How was your nap, Pete? I wish I had naps today. I slept very little last night. But um, maybe, maybe tomorrow. How are you guys doing? Kevin, how are you? Jacob, my NFL team lost and my day is ruined. Who's your team, Jacob? Been a meh football week. Yeah, it has. It has been a meh football week. Are you talking about football, football, or are you talking about American football? What have you guys been up to apart from living or dying by your sports teams? Not fun. Rogelio, doing good. Yo, yo. Pete, I'm going to make sure these guys get in first. Thank you, President Chip. You are the unsung hero of these call-in shows. I already blacked out on Friday at a Halloween party. Jeez, Jacob. <laughs> Chiefs game was horrendous, says Connor Scott. Is it NFL playoffs going on? Or is it just, no, the season's not at playoffs yet, is it? I don't know. I don't follow it. Is it playoffs or is it still regular season? Hey, yo, we beat Columbia and Pan Am games to move on. Yeah, we're going to face Chile in the semifinals. So that should be fun. So it's a scrub team, but there's some impressive performances. Uh, today, I thought Ted Cudipietro looked quite good. Uh, Rodrigo Neri, who's over at the Atletico Madrid Academy, is doing quite well. Uh, it's crazy that, you know, it's not the Olympics. It's not our U-17s. It's not our senior team. We still managed to put together a roster that, despite me saying it's a scrub roster, at least they were, you know, they, they're competing. They're doing well. They beat Columbia. Now, sure, not all of these teams are sending their best, but we're competing and we'll take wins where we can get them. You know, even if it's like depth to the depth to the depth. Eddie says, college football games were great for me this weekend. Good. Good. Um, I'm happy, says Brendan the pretty good. All right. Jacob should have invited me to the Halloween party. <laughs> oh, regular season, says Scott. Matt, how are you doing? All right, guys. Oh, geez. <laughs> when Elkai, Derek says, I just took a Viagra, so ready for the show. <sighs> when Elkai says, hey, Pete, how's it going? Help me. I've been fighting on IG with an Tree fan. Oh, no. For over three days, making fun of us while losing to Germany. And these Powell are overhyping a draw. Oh, these people are overhyping a draw. Yeah, look, first of all, fighting with Tree fans, a fool's game. And I say this as somebody who's guilty of doing it myself as well. But... When you don't have much else going on, you'll have to take a friendly draw with Germany as a big win because you don't have much else to hype up. So, you know, I don't really blame them for that, right? They'll, they'll take that's that, you know, they can't win a regional tournament. So, friendly draws, hey, that's progress, right? And, you know, their boy Santi is doing very, very well. It's about the only guy who is, although credit to Chuki, he got a, he got a hat trick this weekend against Ajax. So, you know, good for him. Good for him. Kevin, what do you think of the first three of the first round of MLS playoffs? Yeah, we're going to talk about that here, too, before we get to the call-in show. Let's talk, starting with Miles Robinson's PSV. Multiple reports this weekend that Miles Robinson will make a free transfer to PSV Eindhoven this January. Now, his contract is up, right? With, with Atlanta, he didn't want to extend, and he wants to go to Europe. He's a free agent. Actually, I don't know when his contract with Atlanta expires, but... If he if it expires before the end of the year, he can technically join them right away. I think if you're a free agent, you can join. No, because the transfer window slams shut. They can't bring him until January 1st. Yeah. Uh, so on that, a couple of thoughts. Uh, I've spoken to a few sources who have confirmed to me that very likely it's going to be PSV. OK, um, and I, here's some thoughts on that. Number one. PSV, while they've been very good up top this season, right? Lots of depth, lots of attacking quality. 
they haven't looked so good at the back. And it isn't always highlighted in the Eredivisie where they dominate. Although, you know, they conceded two to Ajax today, but mostly in Europe. We've seen particularly, they look particularly poor in transition because they're a possession-heavy team. They get numbers high up the field. Taco, be quiet, please. High up the field, and, you know, they get caught out in transition, particularly Romaglio. Romaglio, I think is how you pronounce his name, has not been particularly good. Now, Miles has weaknesses. He does. We, we know this. There are plenty of weaknesses for Miles. But one of his strengths is that he is very fast. And in transition, he, he's good. He's good in transition, particularly because he can make up for whatever weaknesses his, he has or his team has, you know, with his speed. Okay, so that will be a benefit to PSV. The other thing, I, the other reason I think it will be a good move is because one of his biggest weaknesses is on the ball. And the way that PSV play in possession, he's going to be forced to play on the ball a lot which means he is going to improve, right? Just by repetition. Is he going to, is it going to change his profile as a player? No, he's 25, 26 now, actually. So no, you're not going to see massive improvements, but if he can improve on the ball, if he can improve his positioning and his decision-making and his reading of the game, those are his primary weaknesses, right? He's good in the air and he's good in transition. Furthermore, PSV need the help. PSV need the help. And for Miles, I think this is a good first move. We'll see you know, what he looks like. Reality is, I was talking to somebody on the phone yesterday and we were saying, look, we don't have a lot of data on Miles outside um, CONCACAF. He wasn't there at the World Cup, didn't play against Germany, right? Did come on against, um, did play against Ghana. Okay, so that was good. Very, very limited data outside of that. So we're going to really see if he goes to PSV and if he starts for them, what he looks like, both in the Eredivisie, which is a tough league, tougher than MLS, certainly, and also if they manage to squeak out a Europa League spot. Will they? I don't know. It's not looking good right now. They have two points from three games, but actually, you know, getting that draw in Lens was not terrible, right? Getting a draw away in the Champions League is pretty good. Human highlight reel, I put it at the top of the chat. Let me pin it, actually. I don't think I pinned it properly. Did I? Let me pin it. I'm going to pin it here at the top of the chat if you want to do the call-in show. So what was I saying? Yeah, Miles, you know, on says he's going to flop. We'll see. I'm not putting money, right? I want to see what Miles looks like against tougher competition. But if Miles, if they can get out of, you know, they're not going to get top two in the Champions League. Let's be honest, right? Two points from three games. Sevilla and Lons are fighting probably for that second spot. Can they? They're going to need at least one win at home to try and maybe see if they can get that third Europa League spot. So I'll be rooting for them. Let's see what happens. But if he goes to the Eredivisie, we'll get a good look at Miles. I think he will be forced to improve in many areas of his game. And I do think he will bring some value to that back line, even though he has weaknesses. And we'll see. He might flop. If he flops, then what we've been saying about Miles for the longest time is that he's overhyped because he's in MLS. Then we'll, we'll probably be true. Okay. We'll see. Reality is Miles is is in the roster these days, for better or for worse. And Tack, I think, mentioned this on Twitter. But another good thing about him moving is it creates a culture of not being satisfied with mediocrity. Even if Miles goes to the PSV Eindhoven and doesn't play or plays and plays poorly, I'm still happy he's trying. I'm still happy he's going to go push himself, right? With his profile as a free transfer, there are multiple MLS teams that will probably offer him $2 million a year. 1.5 1.5 million a year to stay in MLS and he can pull a Walker Zimmerman or an Aaron Long and be totally fine, live comfortably, great salary. But no, he's tr- he wants to push himself. He wants to go play in Europe. Let's see what happens with that, right? Let's see how it goes. I Personally, I think it's a net positive however it goes because I think he will be forced to improve. I don't expect massive leaps and bounds of improvement from Miles because at his age, improvement is minimal. But being forced to play more on the ball being forced to distribute into midfield, be a possession, be part of a possession heavy team, and also to work on his positioning, his reading of the game, those things are going to be really crucial for him. All right. So again, the last MLS player really that's on the roster in, in now is moving to Europe. Okay. And they will have a full on European team of players playing in top five leagues and for Champions League teams. Right. 
Jack Holt says, at least Miles is pushing himself, unlike some others. Jesus, cough, cough. Oh, Jesus, cough, cough. Exactly. Um, all right. It's been a rough week, guys, for Americans abroad. Has not been good. Geo, Tillman, Pulisic. Well, okay, let's leave Pulisic out of this. Pulled at halftime. Geo, Balogun, pulled at halftime. Geo played on the left wing. We all know it's not his best position. It was particularly tough because Frankfurt really squeezed that side of the field that he was on. I don't think he was great. Like I don't think he was outstanding. He had some really good moments, not consistently enough. I don't think he was terrible either. I thought he tried, you know, considering the circumstances that he had. Um, he got pulled a halftime, whether it was a minutes restriction that was pre-planned or whether they felt that he was not good enough in that game. I don't know. Okay, but he got 45 minutes, which is a heck of a lot better than what he's been getting so far. Hopefully, he can keep pushing. Balogun had a terrible first half uh, against uh, Lille and was pulled. Pulisic had a good first half. Very nice assist, right? Very reminiscent of his first sort of hockey assist for Milan, where he cuts in onto his left, chips it over the wall to the back post, and then it was Leao who gave it to Giroud to score. Today, that little chip went straight to Giroud with a gorgeous backwards header into the net. He was unfortunately pulled at halftime, um, which they said was a flex. It was a, a precautionary muscle flexor issue. So hopefully it's nothing too serious. Um, Pulisic and Musa have been getting lots of praise from Milan fans today. Good. Good. Um, and then who else? You know, others had mediocre weekends, not terrible. Brendan Aronson pulled very early on, had another very, very poor game. That's been disappointing. Sargent is still out injured. Pepe only got seven minutes. Tillman pulled at halftime uh, and some criticism from the coach. Um, you know, Dest was fine, not great, not terrible. Paredes got his first start. Actually, I thought Paredes looked pretty good. I thought he was a good contributor in his first start for Wolfsburg, so that was encouraging to see. Uh, Matt Turner with a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, and, you know, it's just it's not encouraging this weekend. It just isn't. That being said, we tend to get too high when it's a great weekend, when our guys do really well, we're, you know, top of the moon, and then we sink really low when it's not going well. So we just, I think, have to find that equilibrium and understand that we can't live or die on their performances. I think overall the arc this season is significantly more positive than any other week. I mean, uh, than any other season. This season so far, for me, has been the best USMNT abroad season so far. And Pulisic is now at six goal contributions for Milan, which means he's well on his way to be, you know, what I predict could be a 20 goal contribution season between goals and assists. So let's see, right? Find that equilibrium. Hopefully it's better next week. There's some encouraging signs, some poor performances. We move. We keep going. Austin Trusty, I actually thought was a lot better than the scoreline showed. He did get cooked on the first goal that Sheffield United lost 5-0 to Arsenal. On rewatch, somebody on Twitter told me to rewatch it again, and I did rewatch it again. The ball did deflect. It was a very good touch from Eddie Nketiah, and he, you know, he sort of cooked, he cooked Trusty. But other than that, I thought Trusty was quite solid. And even Arsenal fans were praising him and saying, "We sold this guy for four million to Sheffield," and he, and they're right. I think playing out of position for a very different team that's very very poor, you know, is tough. But good, you know, you know, his last two games after becoming a starter, Man United and Arsenal. So I'm I'm fine. He's going to be a starter all season long. Sheffield United will probably get, you know, relegated. Um, but this will serve him very, very well. And it's encouraging to see that he can at least hang in the Premier League, even if he isn't outstanding right now. OK, uh, let's move on to Alex Zendejas. Now, Alex Zendejas, let me pull this up here. Let me pull this up. Now, Alex Zendejas had a very, 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 very poor World uh, Gold Cup. Maybe poorer than, you know, we've seen in, from any player at that level, right? Even a lot of the MLS lifers outperformed him in that World Cup. He might have been one of the worst players on that team. And it made a lot of people start to doubt Alex Zendejas, which is certainly fair. And I don't think Alex Zendejas is a world beater or anything. But since... The League's Cup, since the clausura, the second half of the season started in Liga Mekis, no, not worse than long. Not, <laughs> that would be pretty hard to be worse than long, S27. But since he started in Liga Mekis, he's got four goals and three assists in just about, let me see it down here, 839 or so minutes. Now, here it says three and three, because for some reason they didn't count the, uh, 
the goalie, really nice goal, Golazzo, he scored against Monterrey. On transfer market here, you can see it says that it was today. It was yesterday. He scored a really nice. And I've been watching these goals and assists and a few of his performances as well. He, They aren't tapping goals that he's scoring. They're really nice, like Golazzo's curlers into the far corner, you know, 1v1 goals, beating players. There is definitely still something there. And yes, it's Liga MX, right? We have to acknowledge that. So it doesn't mean anything. Liga MX is not, in my opinion, below MLS, guys. You, you can't look at League's Cup and, and take that as a serious reason that Liga MX is below MLS. But I will say, it is, yeah, it is Liga MX. And if he can keep up this form of, you know, roughly one goal contribution per game, he could still be a depth piece option at that wing spot for reasons that I'll explain. We have right now, Pulisic and Weah are locked in starters. Aronson, for better or for worse, is about the same. I mean, is there, right? He's not improving. Then you've got young upstarts like Taylor Booth, who can't really stay healthy. Kevin Paredes is in the mix. And Alejandro Zendejas. Now, assuming we get Cody Osho, which it seems could happen, not right away, but next year, then, okay, Luca Cody Osho is, is that third option. Now, here's the question. What if we get Wolfsburg to release Kevin Paredes for the Olympics? Um, now you've got maybe Booth and Paredes at the Olympics. So now who's our fourth winger? If not Cole Osho, then Zendejas is in there or thereabouts. It's too early to say. And he needs to start doing this consistently on, you know, for Club America. If he's, you know, getting a goal contribution every game for the rest of the Clausura season, then maybe we bring him in in November, right? Maybe we bring him in in November and, and just kind of see. Why was he terrible at the Gold Cup? I don't know, man. I, I think that even if you watch his performances in Club America and his previous performances for the U.S., I don't think I've ever seen him that bad. It could be multiple reasons. There could be stuff going on. Maybe he tried too hard. Maybe there was something going on in his personal life that affected him. But I think even if you don't want Zendejas on the national team, I think it's fair to say that the level that he showed at Gold Cup is not his level. It's not really his level. Right. Um, so let's see. Let's track him. We'll con I'll continue to track Zendejas throughout the season at Liga MX. There's definitely something there with Zendejas. I don't think he's ever a starter for us or even a first guy off the bench. As a depth piece, let's see. All right. Let's also talk about the under-17 World Cup because that roster was released this year. I mean, this week. And, oh boy, I have some real questions about this roster, guys. They are going to be participating at the under-17 World Cup. And this is the roster. I didn't do a whole video on it because it's the under-17s. So to be honest, a lot of people don't care. And I'm not even going to be able to watch a lot of these games because, the first of all, let me say, let me start off by saying that FIFA, this is being held in Indonesia. FIFA gave this tournament after kicking Indonesia out of the under 20 world cup because they refused to allow Israel to play, even though Israel has qualified. So they take that one away from him and they're like, Oh, don't worry. We'll give you the under 17 world cup. Maybe just maybe if you are not allowing other countries to participate because you don't like them from a geopolitical standpoint, you shouldn't be hosting FIFA tournaments. And maybe it's absurd for FIFA to give them this under 17 tournament, which by the way, most of the world isn't going to be able to watch because of the timing. The time zone is terrible. It's super early. At, well, no, that's not fair, Pete. Europe and Africa, will get, it's a pretty good time zone for them. For us, it's super early in the morning. So we're probably not going to be able to do live streams, but let's get, let's take a look at this roster here. Okay. So, uh, da, 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 da. Gonzalo Sigata's name's 21 pl player roster for 2023 under 17 World Cup in Indonesia. USA will face Korea, Burkina Faso, and France in the group stage. All right, let's take a look. So the USA kicks off Group E play on Saturday, November 12th against Korea, 8 a.m. Eastern time. That's not bad for y'all on the Eastern coast. For me, that's 5 a.m., so not great. Then Burkina Faso on November 15th at 5 a.m. Eastern time. That's 2 a.m. for me on, on the West Coast. Also even less great. And then they finish the group stage versus France on Saturday, November 18th at 8 a.m. So not great timings, to be honest. Um, 
if I'm awake, I might try to do one of these, but I don't know if you guys even care about the under 17 world cup. The timings are rough. And I, I really have questions about this roster. I'm about to go through it here. This was the roster. Okay. Goalkeepers, Adam Beaudry from the Colorado Rapids, Zachary Campagnolo and Duran Ferre from San Diego loyal. And also from the Colorado Rapids, the big miss here obviously is, um, you know, Diego Cochin, who's injured. And that's really disappointing because I think this was going to be a huge tournament for him um, to show his stuff. Injured makes us definitely, definitely weaker. All right. Defenders. Noah Kai Banks from Augsburg. He was not in the CONCACAF qual- a championship that qualified them for this World Cup. And I know very, very little about him as far as the actual profile. Tyler Hall was, I thought, one of the better performers. Um, He plays for Inter Miami. He was one of the better performers at center back. Aiden Harangi, I thought, had a good CONCACAF tournament. Again, it's CONCACAF, so let's keep that in mind. From Eitracht Frankfurt, Stuart Hawkins from the Seattle Sounders, Tahir Raid Brown from Orlando City, and Oscar Verhoeven from uh, San Jose Earthquake. So Verhoeven is a right back, can play left back also, and Aiden Harangi is a right back. What's interesting is Ramirez, who actually played uh, plays for LAFC. I think it's Christian Ramirez was his name. I think it was Christian Ramirez, the LAFC center back, who was quite poor, even in the CONCACAF thing, was not included. You know who's really missing from this roster, though? <sighs> Mataya Kimbani. I don't understand why they don't rate Mataya Kimbani, who, by the way, has two MLS starts. One of them as a 16-year-old, and they are sent as a center back. Good on the ball, has a good physical profile, reads the game well, looks sometimes a little overmatched in MLS, but I would expect that of any 16-year-old center back. So I don't understand why they don't rate him at all. It, it's very baffling to me because for me, if you are earning you know MLS starts, you can definitely play for the under-17s. So that one is a bit frustrating because I thought he would have made our, our defense better. We didn't get Christian McFarlane. He's with the uh, with England, and that's a big disappointment because he's a really highly rated, um, highly rated left back. Okay, midfielders: Matthew Corcoran, FC Dallas kid, on loan to Birmingham Legion. I haven't seen a ton of him, but people I know in Dallas speak very, very highly of him. Taha Habrun from the Columbus Crew. He had a really good, uh, very you know, very strong Concacaf Championship with the under 17s. Um, can play as an eight, can play as a 10, contribute to goals, assists, technical profile. Cruz Medina was not as impressive as we expected him to be in the CONCACAF championship, but still makes this roster. We'll see what he looks like. Peyton Miller from New England Revolution is there. Uh, he was not there. I don't He wasn't there in the CONCACAF. Neither was Santiago Morales. Paulo Rudisil was. And I have a feeling Paulo Rudisil might have to end up playing some left back. Um He'll mostly play left wing. And then you have Pedro Soma, who's probably the best player on this team right now with Cairo Figueroa and maybe Nymphasha Birchimas, who we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, this feels like a midfield for me of probably, obviously, you know, um, Pedro Soma at the six and then maybe a Cruz Medina, Taha Habrun attacking midfield duo. Matthew Corcoran is a bit of a six as well, but still quite young. Uh, Paulo Rudisil will play some, maybe he'll play central, maybe he'll play some wing. It'll be interesting to see, you know, where Sigades uses him. Now up top, it's a little more encouraging. Um, Nymphasha Birchimas from Charlotte in their academy. Very highly rated young player. Uh, a lot of people really, really like him. Okay. Um, uh, Micah Burton. Micah Burton um, did really well. I think he will. I don't. He was. I don't know if he was a top scorer, but he was a, a major goal goal scoring contributor. All right. In that last, he can play on the wing. He can play at the nine. Cairo Figueroa, right, son of Maynard Figueroa, Honduran d- dual nat in Liverpool Academy. Really good, strong, good in the air, good finisher. We'll see what we look like though against these tougher teams. Bryce Jameson is a very interesting name. He wasn't in that CONCACAF championship, but supposedly doing really well with Orange County SC. David Vasquez was there. Um, some good games, some not good games. It's hard to rate these players based on their um, CONCACAF, you know, performances just because they dominated and, you know, some most of the teams they played were so weak. So it's really hard to get a feel for how good will this team look like in 
the under 17 world cup. This is a tough group. All right. Uh, teams from Africa always do well in these youth world cups. So don't underestimate Burkina Faso, Korea. They have very strong technical players can pass around you that like Japan, they're a rising nation. And then France is France. So I think it's going to be a very, very tough group to get out of. I don't want to make a ton of proclamations because I really haven't seen this group against really, really good teams. So this will be a big test for them. Hopefully they can at least get out of their group because the last time we had an under 17 world cup four years ago in 2019, we didn't get out of the group. And that was a group that had Joe Scali, Gianluca Busio and Giovanni Reina. Other than that, it was filled with scrubs. So that's a, you know, a different story. Um, you know, in that world, you know, in that one, we had uh, what's his name was one of the best players, Kobe Hernandez Foster playing at center back, right? We also had Chuturu Odunze in goal. Um, we had a lot of other guys like Jason who plays for NYCFC. Um, but other than that, it was really just Scali, Busio, and 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 Reina who like came out of that group. It was a very disappointing group overall. Let's see what this guys, what you know, these guys look like. Couple of super chats to read before we talk about the MLS structure. Oh, Adam Phobos, thank you so much for joining, man. Really appreciate it. Devonta Joan Jones, BS Indo, they got it. BS Indonesia, they got it. Not the same thing, but the U.S. has been known for denying players, not whole teams, to enter our nation when we host things due to strict laws. Cuba gets screwed over due to our poor relations. Cuba comes every single time, buddy. Cuba comes every single time when there's a gold cup or whatever, and then half their players leave. So also denying individual players if they have a criminal record is not the same thing as denying a whole team because you don't like their geopolitical existence. That is a very different thing. Furthermore, there's nothing that U.S. soccer can do about that. If, if, if U.S. laws don't allow somebody to enter the country, if, oh, Pepe, thank you, Shafi Chaudhary. Pepe was in that under-17 World Cup group also. Forgot to mention that. Um, that's not... That's not something that U.S. soccer or, or CONCACAF can do anything about, right? And there is an argument that if you have a criminal record, you like if I have a criminal record, where I remember when I was in India for seven years, and every time I had to renew my visa, they did a global background check on me to make sure I didn't have a criminal record. And if I did, they wouldn't allow me in either. Many, many countries have that, okay? Um, so you can't just say, I don't like this country, so they shouldn't. So we can't host them and then host what if you want to host world cups and global tournaments, you have to be willing to let every team in who qualified. And I think that's a drastically different thing. Um, Adam Fobles says, I know it's the SPL and he is only playing for Aberdeen, but do you see Dante Povara coming onto the team just for depth? I mean, he plays in a position of need as a winger. Um, he is scoring a few goals here and there for, um, you know, for, uh, what's their Aberdeen. I haven't seen enough of him to really comment on him as a profile, but I will say in the Scottish league, although we have CCV there. So, and Tillman, we called up while he was in the Scottish league. So maybe I need to see more of him. Honestly, Adam, I haven't seen enough of Povara to say he should come. I would say right now, Kevin Paredes and, and, uh, Taylor Booth probably have greater, greater shots at this team, but maybe. Russia has been banned. Okay. But when Russia was banned from the World Cup, which, by the way, I did not agree with. I don't agree with banning soccer players from playing because their government does something terrible. And as Americans especially, I don't think we should be too precious about that because America is far from perfect with our international uh, foreign policy either. I think that FIFA banned Russia. It wasn't like Qatar said, we're not going to allow Russia in. FIFA banned Russia. And by the way, I disagreed with that. I know what Russia should not have invaded Ukraine. I don't think it has anything to do with the Russian soccer players who are just trying to make a living. Okay. Um, so it's very, it's a very, very different situation, Charles. That's, that's my honest opinion. Let's talk about MLS playoff structure and guys, the verdict is out. It's garbage. The new structure and why this structure has been implemented meant it is very obvious. It's a, marketing money-making decision as opposed to a sporting decision. So very short-sighted. 
you get three games. All right. Two games. I would understand to make it fair home and away. One game was better because you give a clear advantage to the higher seed and the lower seed has to play one game away. And that makes it a hell of a fun game because it's all the stakes. MLS regular season has so few stakes already. The one fun part was the playoffs because they had stakes. Now, Don Garber and his cronies have taken a vacuum cleaner and just sucked all the stakes out of that. Okay? Three games, two at home for the higher seed, one away for the lower seed. Or one at home for the lower seed, two away. So you can win. You can get out of that playoff series by scoring zero goals and losing and conceding five. How? Because they don't have draws anymore. You're not allowed to have a draw. Each game must have a result. So if you manage to get a nil-nil draw at home and win on penalties and a nil-nil draw away on and win on penalties and lose the other game 5-0, you will have scored zero goals, conceded five, and still emerged from your group. How is that fair? How It also incentivizes teams to, to play for low-scoring draws. It does. It sucks a lot of the fun and a lot of the stakes out of each and every game and the only reason they do it is because they're trying to get every team a home game so they can sell tickets, so they can make more money at the cost of high stakes quality soccer. Quality soccer, or at least intense soccer, comes from stakes. And your regular season already has so little stakes that now you're like, okay, even the playoffs, which had some stakes, we're going to try to suck all the stakes out of there too. I hate it. And it's just emblematic of everything that MLS is trying to do. Marketing and ticket sales, not building a credible league. It continues to be the Disney Mickey Mouse celebration of soccer league. And it's just frustrating. Like every time MLS, you think, oh, can they start to make some progress here? They take a gun, they shoot themselves in the foot. Pow, pow, pow. But don't worry. We sold a few thousand tickets on that extra game. So a little more money into the coffers. Ah, I don't understand. I don't understand what MLS is doing, guys. Very, very silly. I would understand two legs a little more, although I don't think you really give an advantage to the higher seed, and I think the higher seed should have an advantage. So just have one game. That's what you get for not making it into the top six. You have to play away. You still have a shot, but it's harder. The higher seed should actually get a significant advantage in so in order to incentivize getting a higher seed. What's the difference between being ninth and sixth now, right? You, you should be happy with ninth because essentially, yeah, you have to play two games away, but you still get your home game and you can go away and bunker. And if you have a good goalkeeper, take your chances on a penalty shootout and you could still emerge. Frustrating. And they keep, exactly, Charles, they keep tinkering with the format every single season. So you have a real lack of consistency. Right, You don't know as a fan, how is this going to go every year? You're like, well, let's see what MLS decides to do. Oh, here's this fun new playoff thing we're going to try because the owners are complaining that they only finished ninth and they're mad that they aren't able to sell tickets to the playoffs. <sighs> Feels like MLS will never learn. They just keep doing this dumb things over and over again and then getting mad when people don't give them credit for being a serious soccer league. We want to be taken seriously then take yourself seriously, right? All right, who's ready for a call-in show? We've got a lot of people here that I'll bring up. Let me just... <sighs> Let me just pull up the Discord. If you guys want to call in, hop in the Discord. Um, we have a lot of people waiting. The link is pinned to the top of this chat. So hop in the Discord and President Chip... We'll bring you into the next up room, and then I'll drag you in here. So, first up, let's see who we have waiting. One of the best. Hello. Hello? Hello. Uh, hey, Pete. How are you? I'm good. What's your name, buddy? Uh, it's Lewis. Hey, Lewis. Hi. Uh, I called last week, so I'm glad to uh, enjoy it. So I'm glad to be back here. Hell, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought President Chip was gonna, was gonna bring the guys up first that didn't get a chance. <laughs> no, but you're cool. What's up? Uh, yeah, I thought so as well. But uh, hey, I'm glad uh, early bird gets the worm. Um, I 
I have been known uh, on my Fot Mob because I'm, a, I'm an idiot like that. I, I love using Fot Mob. Um, I've been getting a lot of Diego Luna of notifications, and yeah. like I remember, I remember when people said that you know Diego Luna doesn't look like the like the definition of an American soccer player, uh -huh. and I said, uh, and I, and so for the moment I heard that, I said, I right, I'm backing the Diego Luna horse. And like he scored recently, uh, he scored right now. I think in the playoffs against Houston, and yeah. so like I honestly, he's my one to watch from all the under twenty guys, like Paxton Aronson, um, who else is there? Uh, Rokas Pukstas, Gal Gasoni. But I feel like he's one of the uh, few under twenty um, players that are in MLS that could make it to. Uh, Europe eventually. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so a couple of things. First of all, he's not U20 anymore. They were U20 in that last cycle. So all those guys now right. are more Olympic eligible than U20. We're in a new U20 cycle, but I understand what you're saying. You're saying from that group, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I like Diego Luna a lot. I mean, a technical profile, unpredictable, tricky, you know, tends to over dribble at times, but that's okay. I'd rather that because that's something you can finesse as you mature and grow and, you know, when to dribble, when to pass, when to shoot. That's all decision-making. Decision-making is something that usually comes with experience. And yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I know he's got that really nice goal against the galaxy. And then you're right. He scored against, uh, against Colorado. Was it Colorado, right? In the playoffs. Yeah, it was Colorado. And, and then he scored right. He scored like, I know Houston and uh, Salt Lake. I believe we're playing right now, and uh, I did get a notification that he scored. So I was like, he's so like he's been having some really good past few down the stretch games, heading up to the playoffs when everything um, starts kicking up. So I, I've been very like impressed that, uh, about him, and I'm glad to see that you know he's uh, he, he's he's hang, he's holding his own. Yeah, no, I agree. And profile wise, you know. Brian Clyburn talks about this a lot. And I don't agree with Brian Clyburn on everything. For example, he thinks that, you know, Sam Vines has a better profile than, you know, uh, Anthony Robinson. And, but, but he does make a good point about sometimes we, we look at pedigree over profile, right? And if a player is playing right. in a higher league, we go, oh, he's a better player. But they might just be using him for a specific purpose. Is that really a profile that is useful to us? For example, you might say, not you per se, but somebody could say, oh, Brendan Aronson is a better player than Diego Luna. Well, when we say better, what do we mean? Die you know, Brendan Aronson is useful for running around and creating havoc with his running. But in terms of creativity as a profile, Diego Luna probably has a higher ceiling and certainly has more of that type of profile. So I agree with you. Right. I, I will be honest, though. I haven't watched a lot of him at Real Salt Lake because – there's just too many games to watch and, you know, um, but I'll take your word for it. If he's really playing well and showing, I think with him, the big thing was consistency, right? When he joined yeah. you know, them at the beginning of the season, we really didn't see that consistency from him. Even when he did get on the field, it does start to feel like we're seeing more consistency from him now. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to, uh, I mean, I myself only like watch the highlights of Salt Lake games because I have, Way too many subscriptions that the last thing I need is to get at MLS and Apple TV. But like from what I do see, I do see Diego Luna being very uh, being more confident. He, he gets an assist every now and then when he's not bagging a goal. And so and so like yeah, he may have had that like um, uh, settling in period at the beginning of his time uh, this season. But like at, but like when it's really kicking up and like the uh, the like come the playoffs then i feel like he uh, if he's doing what he's doing now i feel like he could really make a name for himself um and like really help boost his resume and his chances of like getting to a much better team uh in the future yeah and and look this is the beauty of having multiple prospects because not all of them are going to pan out right so when you have right. multiple prospects in a certain position you're more likely that one or two of them are going to pan out that 10 position after Gio and Malik, there's probably three to four guys who are fighting for that third spot for the future, right? So Paxson Aronson, Diego Luna, Brian Gutierrez, who I still think some people might be sleeping on, and then maybe a guy like Nico Shakiris, uh, not to mention Alejandro mm -hmm. Alvarado, although he seems to have stagnated a little bit. 
So that's like five guys. Maybe one or two of them will pan out and become what they ho- we hope they are. But that's why you need multiple guys because you just don't know, you know, who's going to make it and who's not. And I think Diego Luna is certainly showing some some good, you know, some good reasons why he should maybe January camp, right? At push for that for an Olympic spot. Him, Gutierrez, Paxson, we probably won't get in January just because he's at, you know, Frankfurt now. Although they released him last year, but they might use him more. You know, Guti will be interesting to see. Guti, does he stay with the fire for another season or does he move? Like Guti has two goals and nine assists for a terrible, terrible fire team. An absolute disaster of a fire team playing out of position. And I think he's got a very good technical profile as well. So for me, the top three there are Guti, Paxton, and uh, and uh, Luna. Yeah, I, I agree with your list. Um, but I will say, I guess about because you mentioned like you don't know if Paxton will be released for the World Cup. Now I'm for the World Cup for the Olympics. The Olympics are in Paris. And yeah. so like it's an easier flight, I guess, to go from uh Frankfurt to Paris than it was from Frankfurt to um uh Buenos Aires or wherever they had the under twenty World Cup. So I feel like they would release him. I feel like uh without with how knowing what how the Olympics goes, since it coincides uh, the MLS season is happening around the same time. I feel like, uh, yeah, we. I think Paxson would get the easier call in than it would Diego Luna because I feel like the Olympics doesn't eat too much into tra- into preseason training for these um, uh, f- uh, for for the European teams. And uh, but you know, I'll, I'll, we'll we'll see what we'll see when twenty twenty four rolls around and and we get to that point. Yeah. So the Olympics ends on August eleventh, right? The Bundesliga right. may not even have started by then. So you're right. If they could say like, okay, we'll let him go to the Olympics. That's his preseason. And when the Olympics is over, he just comes and joins us. He's not a locked in starter for Frankfurt either. So it's not like, you know what I mean? He's more of a depth slash rotation piece. I was thinking more about the January camp though. I don't think they'll release him for that. Well, yeah, no, don't. I mean, it, well, he's getting playing time now. And, and, and when people, when when I hear about like these people be like uh, the Americans be like, oh I don't know if they're gonna be locked in starters and all that stuff uh, stuff and I was like these guys and then I have to double check their ages and I'm like and I and I always say in my mind I was like these are 19, 20, 21 year olds right. like um, I mean in, in my opinion if they're not fight if they're not near penciled starters by the ages of at least 24, 25, then yeah there could be some concern. But like because I guess nowadays people are really pushing to play younger players now and now in like 2023, like you see what Barcelona have done um, uh, recently and like what um, other other teams have uh, done, especially like here in MLS where I feel like they're playing a lot more youngsters because they don't have to fear about promotion relegation at all. Uh, and they're realizing that. So, I mean, I don't really – worry much about Paxton Aaron. So I would say that this season is better was better than when he was starting off last season when uh, I mean earlier this year when he joined. Um he's like getting integrated and I feel like he's uh, I I I'm much more optimistic, I oh, should say. Yeah. About Paxton Aaron's chances than Bre- chances than Brendan. The lasting in Bundesliga or like lasting in a top five league. Yeah. So I wasn't actually placing a value judgment on Paxton. I was just using it as if he is not a locked in starter to them, they for them by then, they would be more likely to let him go as opposed to if they said, you know, well, he's a big player for us and we need him for that last two weeks of preseason leading up to the start. So it wasn't a value judgment on it's not good. It was more of like the fact that he's not a locked in starter could inadvertently benefit us. I actually think that the European players would have an easier time getting released for Olympics because it's it's preseason for most of these clubs, but preseason is not the end of the world to release a player as opposed to MLS, where these players are in the thick of a big season, possibly even Leagues Cup. So, I mean, I don't right. know. Is, is Chicago going to release Brady or Gutierrez? Is Real Salt Lake going to re- release Luna for the Olympics in the middle of the season? I don't know. That's what I'm curious to see. I feel like if... Yeah, I get that. I feel like if Gaga, though, gets released for... From uh, he'll probably be back from Epen uh, the, the Chelsea Academy. Yeah, I think he would be. If, if Gaga gets released, would Chicago look at that and say, "Well, there's no chance in heck that Chris Brady will start over Gaga Sonina, So why are we going to bring him in? Yeah, it's possible. 
It's very possible. And maybe Antonio Carrera gets his chance then. I don't know. It's possible. Yeah, if they indeed. release Gaga and then, but you know, there's an argument that Brady might start over Gaga. As some people have, I don't know if I agree with that, but I don't think the gap between them is huge. Speaking of Gaga real quick, he had a really good game this weekend for Yupin. That's why he's, he had a shutout against um, Charles Leroy. And Charles I was Roy, like, yeah. good for him. He's like, they're he's they're they're um getting he's getting used to the environment, which is good because I've looked at the teams that have Americans in Belgium, and, and they're all around. Well, outside of um McKenzie and Vines, Brian Reynolds, Griffin Yao, and uh, Gaga Sonina, there I think they're I think they're down on that uh, relegation window, especially Westerlo. Yeah, it's more just reps for Gaga right now. It's what he needs. So, yeah. I mean, uh, Greg, uh, Pete, did you see Greg Brawlter was at the Munch and Glad versus Heidenheim game? I did, yeah. He's on his little European tour. The vibes are not yeah, great they, when Greg they, shows up. <laughs> no, I saw I saw him on TV, and I was like, oh, see, that's why the match was subpar in quality. Exactly. It wasn't as exciting as the um, as the uh, uh, Munich-Darmstadt game that was happening at the same time, those three red cards. Uh, the aura is not there. The aura is the not, there. not there. The aura is not there. Yeah, one last question, I guess, before I, um, I, I, had, I don't want to take uh, um, much of your time, but um, uh, there were people who were, uh, I never, under, there's one thing I never understood, it was the um, calendar versus Horvath for United States gold, uh, the backup position, I guess, to Matt Turner. Mm. I do have, like, I've been leaning a little bit towards, I guess, calendar over Horvath, take that spot, mostly because calendar is... Okay, getting playing time while Horvath is what third goalkeeper now to Vlako Demos and Turner. Yeah, and I feel like when when it comes to like practicing, who who who's on the roster? I mean, uh, Horvath is is like blocking shots from what? I don't even remember who the strikers are for Nottingham Forest outside of like Taiwo Awuni, but Iranga. then there's a straight calendar. Oh, yeah. Alanga, Anthony Alanga, former Manchester United player, we probably could have used him uh, earlier today against City. But then, there, then you have like Calendar, who has to, who, who I guess like is a teammate of Lionel Messi, and I'm sure he's like learning a little. Uh, he's like steadily improving, I guess, in terms of like he has to bail out Kamal Miller and um, and and that horrid backline of Miami, uh, Inter Miami, uh, while uh, and also like block Lionel Messi uh, shots during practice. I feel like I'm a little bit more confident in in like accepting calendar up than Horvath. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't have super strong opinion. For me, Horvath has shown well. Like we have a history of him playing well for the U.S. when it mattered. And so, but I do think that sometimes if a player's not playing, you know, we we don't like the uncertainty of that, and we prefer what we know. Right? That's just human nature what we can see week in and week out has more value than what we don't know. So you can make an argument for, you know, a uh, calendar over Horvath. You can also make the argument that for most of his career, Horvath has not been playing, whether that was at Brugge or whether it was that before, you know, at Nottingham Forest before Luton. And it didn't really impact his form with the U S so you could probably make arguments both ways. I still have Horvath as number two, but he does need to, uh, to be playing. And I think by this winter, he, he's the third goalkeeper there. I think personally, I think Horvath should come to MLS. Like I think, yeah, I don't know. just come back to MLS if at this point, or either go either that or go to a championship yeah. team that needs you where you can start. If you can't find a championship team that needs you, then just come back to MLS. Like there are MLS teams like Atlanta that really need a goalkeeper. I think Horvath to Atlanta would actually be the perfect fit. Horvath or Stefan, who do you who do you say? Horvath. I mean, Stefan is perpetually injured <laughs> and has been in true, terrible yeah. form for a long time now. I don't even think Stefan's even in consideration until he comes back and starts playing somewhere. I was going to say, I have not seen that man since like, uh, like, after, like once the Middlesbrough season um, um, concluded, I was, uh, I thought he would be, yeah, he'd be back at city, but then like, I have, I, I have not heard a, a word about, uh, about uh, the progress on Zach Stefan. So I feel like, him and Horvath, if all else, yeah, go back to the United States. I'm sure, I'm sure Columbus would love to have him back. And yeah, Horvath would definitely 
Uh, I feel like, yeah, Atlanta United need, need some fresh blood. I'm sick and tired of seeing Brad Guzan in goal. Yeah, same. He makes Miles Robinson look awful. Like, he, he's not helping Miles Robinson at all. Yeah, all right. I'm going to have to let you go, man, because we got a lot of people waiting. But thanks for calling in. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. You have a good rest of your day, night, Pete. Yeah, you too, man. Have a good one. Yeah, bye-bye. All right. Let me drag uh, AJ in here. AJ, how you doing, man? Hello? Hi, how you doing? Hey, AJ, how are you? Good, good. And you, Pete? I'm good. How are you doing? Man? Good, brother. Uh, you know, just, just chilling here. Uh, you know, how's, uh, how's the weather in LA been? Uh, dark, gloomy. <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's it's those uh it's those, it's those October it's October weather patterns. Yeah. So, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. So, what do you think of the American week so far? I mean, it's not great. Uh, it's been a rough week, but I'm not like, you know, we're gonna have bad weeks, right? It, it's just gonna happen. Um, I'm not panicking or anything. It's just. Take it on the chin. Let's see how we do next week. Champions League in midweek, some big games. So I'm not too bothered. Obviously, I want good weekends. I want our guys performing at a good level. But there's going to be, you know, ebb and flow, ups and downs. I, I try not to get too high or too low with either really good or really bad performances. Yeah, I, I'm in that same boat. I don't, I don't, you know, there, there's going to be bad days. And it's really all about when it comes to bad days like this, I'm really more interested to see how our boys uh, come back from it more than I'm interested to see like what happens afterwards. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> and again, it's like, if these um, guys were all in MLS having good weeks, week in and week out, people would be praising them, but instead they've chosen the rough road of going to difficult environments at high levels and pushing themselves and suffering the ebbs and flows of, you know, what it's like to play at that level sometimes and, and having to come out stronger for it. You know, hey, I, I'm I'm all with them, man. It, it, you know, it's just the thing with like with international teams, man. There, there has to be mentality monsters, you know, in every position. And I feel that we have a few of those, but I don't think we have enough to kind of to kind of like carry over. I don't know if it's got anything to do with Greg's personality or just the fact that our boys have never been in this position. I, I don't know, man. But you know, I would like to see just you know elite mentality whenever they do have bad games and consistency when they do have good games. And good weeks. Yeah. I'm also a little more forgiving of like the 20, 21 year olds than I am of the 24, 25 year olds. Right. Like I, I oh, understand yeah. inconsistency more from a Reina or a Pepe or a Scally than I do from a Pulisic or a Weston. Speaking of Reina, what do you think? He fin got a start finally under Terzic when it seemed that he all lost it, all our hope had been lost. He didn't take it for sure. Like I wanted him to do more with that start. Um, he started very brightly, created a chance early on, had a really nice dribble too. in like the 10th or 11th minute beat a couple of players cross was cut out, but Frankfurt were also squeezing that right-hand side pretty heavily and him on the wing. It just wasn't really working. And part of that was the way Frankfurt were playing part of the way that was that Dortmund was way too slow in the buildup and that didn't help him, but I don't want to make excuses for him. He had to do better than that if he wants to start more regularly. So that was a little bit disappointing. Yeah, man, you know, it sucks when are you when your favorite player doesn't take the chance they've been given. Sure. But we know we know we know there is a player in Reina. We've seen it before yeah. and unfortunately you don't choose bad days, bad days choose you. So yeah, yeah. I mean he's he was very he's been good off the bench the last few times. This was his first start for them this season. Playing out of position, it didn't work out, but I'm not too worried. I'm, I mean, I'm more worried they might not give him another start for a while. But what can he do? Get your head down, grind, keep trying. You know, it's DF, DFB Pokal this week, I believe, not Champions League. So maybe he'll get another start. Hopefully they start him central because that's where he can really impact a game, you know? I got to say, I was shocked when I saw him play against Newcastle. I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, it's like, what, the fourth and fifth sub next? What are the odds Gio Reyna gets on the field? Yeah. He got on the field, and honestly, I don't really have a rating for him. He's just he was just he was there making passes. He had a foul that I thought was going to cause Dortmund like in the, in the dying embers of the game, but thank God it didn't go against him. Yeah, almost did though, almost did. Yeah, Oof, man. But um, 
So I actually had a question I wanted to ask you. I, I got to pick which one of the three that I wrote down. Do you think, okay, here, here's a good one. Do you think Balogun, like, do you think Balogun being upset in the last camp, like, like the one we played Uzbekistan and Oman, do you think him being upset with Greg's tactics had a, had a hand to, uh, played a hand in like Greg's new formation and like new way of playing? Or do you think that it's just a coincidence that Greg changed it up? It's possible. I don't know. You ask me to speculate here. So I, I think that Greg, you know, we saw the four three three in the first camp, a little bit with Tillman when he was there, and then now that Gio's back four two three one, I do think that Balogun mentioned very specifically he likes playing with Gio, he likes combining with Gio, and Gio can feed him, and I do think it's the chorus of voices, right? When you have a guy like Balogun, let's be honest, Pulisic and Adams and McKay, they're a little bit of Greg's yes men, and Gio was like the odd one out that was like the quote unquote spoiled brat that didn't agree. And now you've got Balogun being like, this is the guy that's going to feed me, Greg. So now you've got more chorus of voices. Did that impact Greg's decision? I don't know. It's like BJ and Anthony Hudson brought this 4-2-3-1 with Geo. How much of that played into Greg's thinking? I don't know. But I, I'm just happy to see it, however it came about. And I think Geo did enough in those two games to be like, duh, 90% of the fan base was right. And that's the frustrating part, isn't it, is that you know, the fact that we were right, but it's, it's not as if, it's not as if, uh, the, it wasn't tried before by the, by the last two interim coaches. And it's not like BJ won it with using the four, two, three, one. Yeah. So I'm a little confused as to why I go back to the four, three, three against weaker opponents. When, when your two interims managed to manage to, to just completely wipe out the competition. Okay, well, to be fair, Gio to wasn't there right in that first camp. Yeah. So, you know, he did use Tillman, but it was more in a 4-3-3 than a 4-2-3-1 for sure. Let's see what he does against sure. Trinidad and Tobago in November because if he goes back to 4-3-3, we're all going to kill ourselves. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he will, though. I, I, I like Now, granted, I'm, when it comes to Greg, man, you know, I, like I told you before, man, I, I'm in that limbo where, like, I want to be excited and I want to support my team. But it's just, it's just like, oh, my God. It, it, it pains me to see him back there, you know? Yeah. So for me, for me, it's like I'm cautiously optimistic that we've, we're finally turning this new leaf because for two games in a row, Gio played down in the middle. So and yeah. when was the last time we saw Greg do something right twice? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's it, it's rare if it's ever even happened at all. Yeah. And I'm just excited to see what what happens against Trinidad and Tobago, I think we should mop the floor with them. Honestly, like it, yeah. it's, I understand turning out that we should never, you should never underestimate the opponent because it's not, it's, it's not the right thing to do, but let's be honest. You know, we're the better team with the better player pool, right? It, Guatemala had them pinned down for a good, like 30 minutes. It, it's, it's just, no, there, there, there shouldn't be any excuse. It, this, this is not an excuse. Yeah. No, we 100%. should mop the floor with you guys. hundred percent. Um, one more question. One more question. Dude, I'm going to have to let you go. Up. So, guys, sorry to cut you off, man. Uh, we got a lot of people waiting, and it's kind of dragging. Okay, okay. I know you have a ton of questions. I'll try to do this every week, so pop in next week. Um, I just oh, got I 10 people waiting, and then some people don't get to talk at all, so I have to keep it moving a little bit. Okay? All right, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. No worries. Thanks, AJ, for popping in. All right, brother. I'll see you. Have a good one. You too, brother. All right, so here's what I'll do for now, guys, to make sure we can get as many people in. Uh, I'll do five minute, five minute limit, okay? Five minutes is the absolute max. If you have a question, try to give it out soon. I'd love to chit-chat more, but there's a lot of people here, too, that also want to just hear about soccer. So let's keep it to soccer and, and you know, just keep it punchy. Next up, we got Mike. How you doing, Mike? Hello? Hello, Mike. You're on the air. Oh, uh, hey. Um... How do you? I have, a, I have a, just a short question. Um, well, not really a question, but I also have a statement after the question. Sure, but go for it. Um, so I watched the Milan game. I just want to say it was actually an amazing game. I really enjoyed it, just in general. Um, well, my question to you is, um, how do you think Pulisic? Why? Why do you think they Pioli took Pulisic out? So what we're hearing is that was a precautionary injury sub. So apparently he felt mm. something in his flexor muscle and they pulled him out as a precaution. So that's what Pioli oh, said man. after the game. 
Thank God. Because <laughs> you don't want him getting injured again. Yeah. Well, no. It's the right, right, the right call. If you yeah. start something, you don't risk it, you know? Exactly. But I think looking at Milan's um, game today, the first half and the second half were completely opposites from each other. Um, sorry, I have a bit of a cold. No, you can <laughs> hear me sniffing and stuff. But um, I feel like when I saw Milan's attack, they look so much better with Pulisic there. And for me personally, when I was looking at Leal, he didn't really have a great game. And it's kind of been like that for Leal for a minute. Like he's been pretty poor. Or he's been okay. Um, again, you'll see moments of brilliance because you know it's Rafael La- Leal. But um, me personally, I'm not like even trying to overhype Pulisic. I genuinely think that that attack is completely different with him in that starting lineup. Um, yeah, because like you just saw it today. Like Leal, he would on his side constantly lose the ball, make a misplaced pass, might try to do too much, hold the ball too long, and lose it. With Pulisic, today he just did everything right. Like, every time he touched the ball, he looked dangerous. He was connecting. Um, he even almost had a couple couple um, shots on goal, but they got deflected. And I was looking at this, and I was like, wow, like, this is a completely different attack with him there. Yeah. Um, I think it's – and another thing about it is I feel like with Pulisic, when we first – when he first went there, we didn't – you know, we hoped – that he would keep his, you know, injuries fine and, you know, his injury record, you know, well, and also make sure that he's, um, you know, playing consistent. Because I can say, like, in the past, Pulisic did have an issue with consistency sometimes. Like, he'll be probably the best player on the pitch one game or two games. Then maybe the next one or two games, he's either invisible or just okay, right? Sure. Um. So, um, I don't know. I, f- I feel like with um, Pioli, I, I think most of his signings have been very good, including Pulisic, 100%. Um, but also, do you, what do you think about Musa's performance today? I actually didn't watch the game. I was driving back from Oh, Vegas. really? I watched the highlights of Jesus. the game, but I didn't <laughs> see the game itself. But real quick, and then I'll let you go. The thing about Leao has mm. been pretty much like that this whole season over dribbling Mm -hmm. good transition moments he's got Giroud or Pulisic free but he wants to beat one more player and then that you know counterattack, that transition moment is lost because they get numbers behind the ball and it kind of kills it and I agree with you there's an inconsistency all this season moments of brilliance punctuated by frustrating inconsistency with Leal so I think you know if if that continues then the fans will start to get pissed too so yeah and I honestly think that if he keeps performing this way I honestly have a feeling Kelly might drop him or put and put Pulisic on that left. They don't have or any and play somebody else on the right. They don't have options. And, and that's another thing. Yeah. Because yeah. Chuck Wazy else. hasn't really been yeah, he hasn't really been that good. And, and you and saw Luca Romero. Now. And he's injured. So Yeah. yeah. And Luca Romero doesn't look ready because he played today. Oh, how did he look? But Pretty good. Luca, no, he didn't look that good today. Okay. Um defensively he looked fine, but going forward he just looked like he was confused all the time. Every time Luca Romero got the ball, he just didn't know, didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. A couple of times Musa would feed him the ball. Luca would try to beat a man, lose the ball or get fouled or um, he'll miss touch the ball. And it's like, man, I don't think Luca, and you know, Luca Romero's young, so I don't want to be too hard on him, but I was like, man, I feel, I feel like if Pulisic is out, Milan are kind of in trouble on that right-hand side. Yeah. Cause they really don't have anybody. Because yeah. even with Chuck Wazy, when he played, he wasn't really that good. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Hey, yeah. man, you're, you're five I'll minutes you go, up. Though. I got to let you go. Yeah, no problem. Have a good night, Pete. No worries, man. Thanks for hopping in. Thanks for hopping in. Yep. See ya. All right, guys. Let's keep it punchy here. Uh, remember, I know you want to chat and I want to chat with you too, okay. but there's a lot of people watching the stream too. So let's keep it punchy. Ask a question or make a point. Try not to ramble too much. I know it's hard. I know right. It's not easy. Hold on. I need to mute you on the YouTube. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this go blue? All right. Um, yes. What's up? So I just first want to say that um, you and Tax Show got me really obsessed with youth prospects. Okay. 
to the point that I think my parents are a little weirded out. But I wanted to do the public a service by kind of analyzing really quickly the U17 roster because I know you don't know all the players, but I do. Okay. Dude, if that's I, all right I, with hang you. On. I don't know if you should do that on the call, though, because you've got a very limited amount of time here. Um, I can go through it in five minutes. In five minutes? Can you do it in three minutes? I can do it in three minutes. All right. Give us your quick thoughts. Okay. One, the goalkeeper room is very bad. Yeah. There are three goalkeepers ahead of them that were not called in. One was coaching because he got injured. Yeah. But there's another MLS because Zachary uh, Campionlo is still an academy player when there's a New York City goalkeeper that basically was doing really, really well in MLS Next Pro. He didn't get called in. Um, Julian I Stone is another one who didn't get called in. He has high ceiling. So I was kind of surprised by that. Mm hmm. So the goalkeepers weren't great. The defenders, I've heard a lot of really good things about Noah Kaya Banks. Yeah. Specifically for like uh, professional scouts for you for like European clubs. Uh-huh. Um Paul, Paul is a good selection. Aiden Harangi, I think he's probably gonna play right back. He's decent. Hawkins is fine as well, but really Mataya and Kambani is the biggest miss here. He's definitely one of the better center backs. Yeah, I don't Banks. understand that exclusion at all. Tyre Reed Brown, solid left back. Um, surprise, Payne and Miller wasn't listed as a left back. That's the one guy that is probably better than him. Uh, Verhoeven's also the best right back. Cora Koran, uh, if I pronounce that right, very good prospect. Uh, he was kind of snubbed for a while. He's doing well in UCL Championship. Uh, Bruin is another good center mid. Uh, Medina is, I know people are hyping Medina, but he's kind of like around the 10th best prospect in the age group. Uh, right, talked about Miller. Santiago Morales, good 07. Uh, Ruta Seals, interesting. I've heard not great, great things, but not bad things either. Mm -hmm. Soma is a guy that could be like really special. Yeah. So he's kind of limited professional contracts because it's his age and the fact that he doesn't have a European passport, I think. Yeah. Um, forwards, Nefasha Bertimas, that dude is really, really good for his age. Yeah. He is a special player. So we can get excited about him. Uh, Burton, decent, pretty good. Uh, Figueroa is probably the best striker, though I have no idea why we didn't call in Caden Glover. That one also kind of made me question. That's the uh, he's doing St. Louis well. kid, right? Caden Glover? Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, Bryce Jamison, good winger, solid. David Vasquez, around the same. But the one other giant snub I want to talk about is uh, Christopher Olaney for Philadelphia Union, too. Uh -huh. He was a center mid that's been balling out, so I don't know why he didn't get called in. But, yeah, that's kind of the quick, rough outline of the team. Cool, man. You did that in three minutes. I'm impressed. I didn't think you'd be able to. Oh, well, yeah. It's basically, I've been spending my free time learning as much as I can about the youth national team system. What's your name? And my club in the club system. It's too complicated. That's all I'm going to say. Is this Alex Calabrese? Because you sound like Alex Calabrese. Um, my name my name is Alexander, but it's not, my last name's not. My name's Alexander Rosas. Oh, okay. Because there's a kid, a Chicago kid, who so you kind of sound like him. His name is Alex Calabrese. And he's an Italy fan, too. So when you said go blue, I got suspicious. You got, yeah, that, that's fair. Um, so I think I'm, and my, and my neighbor, I'm a kid from Portland. I don't play for Portland Timbers, but I'm in that area. Gotcha. So soccer is definitely the dominating sport here. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thanks for hopping in. I appreciate it. Thanks for talking. I won't take up more of your time. No, no. I don't worries. know how to remove myself, though. Thanks, man. Thanks, Alex. You have a good one, okay? Bye. All right, guys. Be a little patient while we figure this out. Like, there's going to be, you know, hick hitches as we go and figuring out timing and the best way to go. Um, but so be patient. I know it's like a little frustrating for some people. Maybe you want, you know, it's too long or whatever. We'll figure out. We're figuring this out as we go. So just be patient. Danny Sizzle, what's up? Pete, how's it going? Good, man. How are you? 
I'm doing great. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about player development. Sure. And more specifically about developing strikers. Mm. I'm sure you're well aware of the fact that, you know, the modern game, it's really difficult to develop strikers. That's part of the reason why uh, Erling Haaland is such a, you know, so well known because not only is he an elite player, but he's doing it at a position that is hard to come by nowadays. Yeah. You know, you look at all the best national teams in the world and a lot of them are having issues. Germany, Spain, right? Mm -hmm. All of them are having trouble producing, you know, elite strikers. Yeah. Even the teams that do have elite strikers like France and England, their best strikers are above 30 years old. Right. So, so even uh, at the youth level, you see um, the United States having difficulty producing strikers. We were forced to play, I think it was uh, Quinn Sullivan at the striker position at one point. Paxton and that's, also. you know, obviously not ideal. Yes, yes. Um, which is, oh, I'm also very excited that we got Fuller and Balogun for that exact reason. Because yeah. it's a lot easier to poach strikers from other nations than it is to develop them. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I see an opportunity for the United States to maybe potentially um, separate themselves from the rest of the pack, so to speak, and be able to develop strikers. Because if we can, um, if we can throw all of our resources and the money that the United States Federation definitely has yeah. behind developing elite strikers, that is something else that no other nation in the world, as of yet, has been able to do. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just. So yeah. obviously that. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to quickly say that it's uh, easier said than done. For sure. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, if you were in charge, what would you do to, you know, potentially help these young strikers develop into quality at the national team level? Yeah. So I think this is part of a bigger conversation about how the world has changed in the last 20 years. Okay. They used to call Wayne Rooney the last of the great street footballers. And that is because... As the world has become more technology driven and as more and more kids are no longer playing outside unsupervised the way that they used to because everyone's worried about pedophiles and because everybody has iPads and phones now, kids are not playing pickup soccer anywhere in the world as much as they used to. And like especially in Western Europe, as you know, kids go inside more, their parents don't want them unsupervised. You, you know, like when we were kids, we would ride our bikes out play soccer for five hours. And, you know, that is a huge, huge part of a player's development up until about 12, 13 years old. But even in Europe now, they're getting kids into academies, okay, at five and six. Manchester City has an under five team, right? So what are you doing is you're coaching instinct and creativity out of teams at very young ages. And this has been going on for the last 10 years, 10 to 15 years. The world has changed. So there's not enough street soccer being played. It is still like that in places like Africa and South America more, but in more developed nations, like in Western Europe, the United States, it's always been a problem is you're coaching creativity, talent, and instinct out of players from a young age. Cause you're in an Academy, you're learning how to pass and move. You're doing rondos and, and yeah, you're developing more creative midfielders and more good cogs in a machine who can pass and move and understand tactics from a younger age. But you're not developing elite world-class strikers. You're, you know, Ronaldo Phenomenon or, you know, guys like that, the Ruud van Nistelrooy, amazing poachers, because so much of that is learned at a young age. Instinct, selfishness is good when a, when a seven-year-old has the ball. I want selfish players. I want players who try to dribble around the whole team when they're seven, because guess what? That's, they do that for four hours a day for 10 years. You're going to have an amazing player on your hand, on your hands. So I think it's part of a bigger problem in society where it's changing and i think we need to go back if i was in charge and i've talked about this many times i would have more futsal more street soccer more unsupervised play or supervised for safety but less coaching and more letting players play letting them try things at young ages and develop that instinct for a, a, you know they they say you can't coach instinct and that's very true in many ways you can't coach it to, you know you can players develop instinct from very young ages. And oftentimes the players who are really successful now are the kids who had soccer parents 
who kind of un- probably understood that a little bit more, like your Erling Hollands or you know your Gio Reynas. Um, but I think it's it's mostly over coaching. We're coaching creativity out of our strikers from very very young ages, and even in Europe, they're putting kids in academies way too early. In Brazil, in our in Argentina, in most of South America, and even in Africa, they don't get into good academies until they're 12, 13 years old. So. That makes perfect sense. Thank you for uh, thank you for your time. No worries, man. Thanks for hopping on. Yeah, take care. All right, the man, the myth, the legend himself, President Chip. How you doing, Mr. President? Good. How are you? I'm good. Yes, sir. It's the it's the president himself. I expect I expect votes this election. No, I'm kidding, guys. <laughs> uh, but yeah, to get into it, uh, I want to talk about. I want to resume the conversation about Robinson real quick. Anthony because or Miles? obviously, you know, we Miles, Miles, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I have to <laughs> I have to be specific. The um the news is out. He's probably gonna go to PSV. That's most likely what is going to happen. And as an Atlanta fan, obviously, you know, this was inevitable. I mean, after the news came out that he wasn't really going to renew his he wasn't looking to renew his contract because we weren't gonna give him that type of money that he was asking for. Yeah. Um it was pretty much inevitable he was going to go to another MLS club who was going to give him that money, or he was going to test himself and go to a European club, which is what is going to most likely happen. And personally, just like as a U.S. national team, looking at him, uh, you know, at the eyes of a U.S. national team fan, not an Atlanta fan, um, it's definitely a great move. He's not going to be Jesus Ferreira and stay and not challenge himself. He's going to tell whether or not it's too late. That's a different argument. Right. But he's going. And Pete, I know I know some of the people in the chat. I know you might not like what I'm about to say. But I have to be real with you, man. I don't know. I don't know if he's going to do that well. Okay. I mean, I don't dislike it or like it. It's just a matter of opinion. We honestly have no idea how he's going to do. And this is a big test for him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. And I think if if he does well... He does well. Good for him. Yeah. He he he'll gain us better spot on the, on the team, obviously. And if he does bad, I then obviously you know it's back to MLS. But yeah, but, I just I don't know. I, you can't. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Keep going. You just you you like there's games you know in the MLS where he he gets like he just get outclassed by Campana, <laughs> yes. and then there's other games where he has an amazing game. And he's doing, and he's covering up for Brooks Lennon's defensive mistakes, which happens a lot. And uh, to add on to that, we also can't all like when your goalkeeper doesn't dive to save his life, and your right back is giving up balls and giving up, and, and, and your midfield is just messy. You have to take that into account as well when talking about Miles. Like I'm critical of Miles, and there are mistakes he makes with us that are his fault. But there are so many more that are not his fault, which I think needs to be taken into consideration as well, sure. which is why I moved to PSV and to the Air Divisi. I'm not, like, coming on here and saying, Miles is going to suck so bad. No. Not only am I a fan of him and fan, you know, a fan of the club that he plays at currently, but I just I, I just think we have to look, take that into consideration. No, for sure. And look, I, I highlight Austin Trusty as a guy who was playing in MLS. He was a good MLS center back, but nothing special. And then he go, yep. he went to Europe with the right mentality. So he goes to Arsenal. He spends six months at Arsenal, probably learning to be better on the ball, learning positioning, training with elite players. Okay, so getting better for those six months. And then he goes down to the championship and spends a year there, pushing himself and improving. And now he's starting, albeit for a very bad Premier League team, but still the Premier League. And that rate of improvement over the course of 18 months is huge. But also, and I think this was Anthony Hudson who said this, he talked to the people at Birmingham and he said they've never seen a player more eager to improve and more hardworking than Austin Trusty. So a lot of it is mentality. If Miles is going to PSV and going, I have weaknesses that I need to improve on and this is my chance to improve on them, right? And he does, then we could see a better Miles Robinson than we've been seeing in MLS. Like you said, there's consistency, there's really good games and also some inconsistency from him. So Will he learn consistency? For me, his two big weaknesses, like I said earlier, is possession, positioning, and reading of the game and and just being more consistent. Yeah. If he can improve 15% at PSV than he is now, we've got a better center back in the center back pool, even if it's a depth center back, right? 
So I think it's a good yeah. move. If he fails and he's not at that level, then we understand, well, if this guy can't even play in the Eredivisie, should he be a national team player? Right. We don't know. Like we're going to learn a lot about miles with this move. Yeah, most definitely. And of course, you know, we have the Columbus crew coming up, which I will be streaming at. I'm excited to see how he, how he does there. Um, but, uh, just a real quick to stay on Atlanta and Horvath. I like that idea. Pete, I was going to say here, but you, you said it for me, Ethan Horvath to ML to MLS to Atlanta, please. I'm begging him because if we have another season with mannequin, man, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> it's crazy. That guy's still starting in MLS. At, I know. I know. I, <laughs> I, 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 I send a super chat to, to tack. <laughs> we were watching LAFC versus Miami and I mentioned Guzan and he was like, Brad Guzan, who <laughs> he's still there. He, still there. Thought he was retired. Yeah. Tack yeah. genuinely thought he was in the retirement home and that he had left like five seasons ago. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man, your five minutes is up. Yeah. I got to keep it moving. All right. Hey, have a good one, Pete. Thanks, Thanks for President Chip. Appreciate it. Antonio Banderas. What's up? Hello. Yeah, hello? Hey, Antonio, what's up? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, what's up, man? How's it going? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. Thank God. You know, everything is good. Hey, man. So um, I just want to give a quick shout out to the San Jose Earthquakes because I'm from San Jose. And uh, I just want to say that, man, we had a horrible playoff game. Yeah, I didn't watch it. Dude, literally, dude, I, I, I don't know if you know about our owner, John Fisher, but mm -hmm. he invests almost nothing into the team he's also has he also owns the oakland a's uh -huh. which i don't know if you know about baseball but they're just having a crisis and i don't i don't know like if we're on the up or not because you know we got greg berhalter's assistant coach yeah and you know lucho and i mean we did improve quite a bit not gonna lie we we made uh well the wild card like you know the new format that came out which i'm not a fan of yeah me neither but uh i just wanted to talk about uh that real quick and just say that it, it, it sucks being an earthquake fan but uh hopefully it gets better but uh you know i i support the u.s and uh uh i've i've uh i've been talking to people i'm 19 and uh i've i've commented this in a big page um on instagram called us soccer plus something like that mm -hmm. and i said as a 19 year old you know in my lifetime i for some reason it's this dream that i i almost can visualize it i i believe that maybe maybe when i'm like 80 years old 90 if i get there hopefully <sighs> that we can win at least one world cup I have this vision that it's going to happen. Yeah, I, I actually don't disagree. I think you're talking about your 19, the current, let's say 80. I, the current life expectancy is 74, 75. They expect that to go up. You're talking about 60 years. That's a lot of World Cups, right? And, and a lot of chances for us to Almost get better definitely. and improve. So. And, uh, and the thing is, too, you know, my father, well, I'm Mexican-American and just supporting the U.S. Um, well, uh, years back, I've been supporting them since... Because I've grown up playing soccer, you know, youth soccer. You know how it is here, pay to play. I uh, I grow up, I grew up playing you know, like Sunday leagues and you know all of that. And I remember all my teammates that were Mexican Americans as well. They all, eighty percent of them supported El Tri. And me personally, I wasn't raised on that. And uh, I've always supported the U.S. And I remember they would they would laugh at me. They'd be like, "Oh, the U.S. sucks. Why do you support them?" And it was it got so ridiculous because um, the World Cup was happening. I remember 2014, and I remember uh, Mexico would play. They'd support them, right? And then the U.S. would play. And instead of supporting the U.S., they would support the, the other team. Yeah, because the and U.S. I'm is like, the rival. That's what rivalries look like. And I'm like, how is like how are you going to like – I know it's not, it's not really political, but it's more like how are you going to like live here, be born here, and like – we're not that horrible. Like, what is the problem with the culture that we can obtain? Well, we're starting to obtain new fans now, you know? Yeah. But 
what do you think was that big change that got people on that boat? I think the U.S. Just being good really Europe. helps, right? The kind of players that we're now producing and having being good is part of it. I do think that that's a big part. I think also uh, a generation like you that you were born in the U.S. or were you? Did you move here? Yeah, I was born here. Yeah, right. So your here, parents God. came from Mexico. You were born here. I think not all, obviously, but there are more guys like you who feel an affinity to the U.S. Like you're of Mexican descent, but you're American. You're born and raised in this country. And there's a part of you that loves this country, I'm sure. And and now the soccer oh, team is sure. getting better. And so you support that. And you want I, I think that's a lot of it, like immigrants, children who come from soccer first families. Right. Because let's be honest, many families in America are not soccer first, even if they like soccer. But if you come from a Mexican family, more likely than not, it's soccer first. And so yeah. you grow up being taught to love the game. But you and you feel, you know, pride, obviously, in your Mexican roots. But I'm sure, of course, you also yeah. feel like I'm American and I want America to do well. And now we have a team that actually could do well if we didn't have such a sucky ass manager. So I think that's probably yeah. oh, a good man. part of it. And uh, I don't know how much time I have left, but let me just say this. from what, I'm not a tactical master, right? But I can see that we have very good – we have a good blueprint, okay? We have – our dude, think about it. Our league is very new. We, it's mediocre at best, but the fact it's growing very fast. And not only that, we're developing new academies. We're starting to get there to get rid of the pay-to-play system with MLS Next. It's not perfect, but we're getting there. Not only that, but we're developing and exporting players at a, at a pretty decent rate. So think about it. In years to come, the sport is is not it's, it's just going to keep growing. I That's agree. why I'm optimistic. We have a good blueprint. We at the moment we don't have a world class team, but we have a team that can do like a Morocco type run. We can upset teams. We just need a, a manager who is tactically able and not dumb. We, we have uh, players that can, you know, grind out a result against maybe like a, like a Argentina. Yeah. Maybe just like a, like an Italy. Yeah. I, I don't, there is no reason why we should have a mentality that we're not good enough. We should, we should have a, a manager and a federation that can say, Hey, you know, you guys, we have what it takes to develop a good national team. We have a, we have what it takes to develop a good league and we have what it takes to hire a manager who's going to push us to that next level and give the players the confidence they need. Yeah. Look, I got to get going here, but I'll just say real quick, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, we need versatility. We It's fine to have a possession scheme to want to attack teams. You go do that against the best teams in the world. They're going to kill you in transition. Oh yeah. You're going to get touched. And, that's yeah, naive, no. and we need more versatility in our tactics. We're not Brazil. We're not France. We can't even they all have a certain amount of versatility and they're less Brazil because they're not known for being tactical geniuses. But even the best teams in the world have tactical variants and we need to add that. Right. And and mentality is huge. Also being able to grind out that self-belief, grind out results that we don't deserve. That's how you go places in a World Cup. So thanks for hopping in, though, man. I got to let you go. Thank you, man. Have Appreciate a good one. It. All right. Thank you. Gabe, how you doing? Yo, Gabe. Oh, yeah. Hold on one sec, Pete. Hey, Pete. How you doing? Good. Uh, I kind of just have two questions that kind of go together. So, Trinidad, we play them at home first. Who, like, every for the most part, everybody kind of picks themselves. But I was going to say, would you rather start? I'm just going to say McKinney would be over Musa. Would you rather start Musa or Mc, or Johnny to just see what Johnny can do in a pressure game with more of an actual defensive? I'd probably type start in Musa. There. Sorry, say, say, did you say something? Oh no, I don't. I don't think I did. Well, I'd start Musa just because I think we're going to have a lot of the ball, and I think that Musa is a guy who, you know, in possession is more effective right now than Johnny, certainly. Um, but it's not far, right? I think Johnny, maybe you give him the last thirty minutes, but the idea should be beat up on Trinidad and Tobago at home, so that it isn't even a question when we go away. Like five nil should be the expectation for that game at home. Um, I'd yeah. probably start Musa. Yeah, I think Musa deserves that. it. That's his spot. He's a starter. Johnny's. 
improving and he's getting better. And there was an encouraging performance against Ghana, but you know, I still think he's not a locked. He's not a starter for us yet, but have him in the roster, have him back up Musa. Maybe you give him 30 minutes if it's four nil up and see how he does there. You know? Yeah. I was, I was just thinking like, hopefully it's just like three plus four plus nil leg one. And then minimum I'd say. Yeah. And then you can heavily rotate away and give other guys chances. But like, I was like, would you, I know. And then with that, like I'm fine, I'm I'm fine with that. But with that, and I know this player doesn't like playing here. They were uh, playing the midfield, but I like I don't see a huge drop off from McKinney or Musa at times in their role. Would you rather, or st- like if Dest was out and it's a possession type of game, would you rather just start McKinney at right back, kind of p- move him into the midfield a little bit in the deeper parts? With Johnny or start Scally, I'd probably start Scally. I don't think you take McKinney out of that right back, out of that midfield position. I think he's a lot more goal dangerous than Musa. Um, I think he's much better in the air than Musa, and I think he's pretty dynamic as that eight. Like for me, McKinney's a lock-in starter with Gio Reyna there. Uh, I think if Dest is out, you give it to Scally. You know, um, Scally can do a job at right back. He's not Dest from an attacking point of view, but I think he can do a job there. And you know. I, I wouldn't put McKenny at right back in order to accommodate the difference between Scally and Dest, but that's just me. Yeah, I was just thinking you could kind of invert him a little and just give him like the freedom and just you have to, so much of the ball you don't need his defense. So you just yeah against Trinidad and Tobago, you mean? And, yeah, or somebody like yeah, I probably wouldn't do that against Canada or Mexico even. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. It depends who you're playing, right? Like it, it, a bad team, like a bad team in Concacaf, just like I Scally's deserves to be in the roster. Pretty good backup for U.S. and good defensively. It's just going forward, like we need more attack. Just not have nothing going down the right was kind of my thought. Because Musa yeah. McKinney can do it, and then you can, and then Wei can just provide at least in the attack. It would just because the attack kind of goes to a two three five, so he still stays in that role, but like. Instead of like switching between going in the box and passing, he kind of just stays deeper. Yeah, I mean, I think that. you really don't need our our fullbacks. This idea that we need our fullbacks to be really attacking all the time, it's not really true. That's a Greg Berhalter thing that the fullbacks have to be high up the field. And like Dest is that profile, so I understand it. But I really think if you've got Wea, Geo, Balogun, Pulisic, McKinney on the field, you really don't need your fullbacks getting that high. I'd be fine with Scally staying home and just being kind of a stay at home center back. You know. Yeah, I I think that would fine some games with Robertson, but like, you got to speak nice up a little, man. We can't hear you. Oh, I said it's good to get that, and then like it's just if you can't, it's always good to have attack from the fullbacks. When, yeah, um, you can't yeah, it's it's definitely a nice but thing. Reina, to but Reina totally helps the midfield with all that. Yeah. Issue. All right, Gabe. Thanks for hopping on, man. I'm gonna have to let you go. No problem. Have a good one, buddy. You too. The ATL guy, another Miles Robinson conversation. Uh, no, not this time. All right, what's <laughs> up, buddy? What's your name? My name is Jack. Say that, um, say that again. All right, so my name is Jack. Jack, hey, Jack. Yep. Um. All right, so you have just become the commissioner of the NLS. And what what would be the first thing you would do? First thing I would do, raise the salary cap. Uh, is promotion relegation on the table? Because that's not really a commissioner's call. I would push for it. That would be um, the first thing I would do. Probably not. I don't, I don't feel like he has the, the yeah. power to do that. Okay. So if it's not promotion relegation, then I would definitely... Raise the salary cap to 25 million, eliminate all of the rules, except maybe keep one DP if you want to sign a Lionel Messi or a Cristiano Ronaldo, but raise the cap to 25, set the the minimum spending to about 10 million, and give teams the freedom to have quality distributed across their roster instead of forcing them into this terrible use of the money that they're spending right now. 
That is in a nutshell what I would do. I would also get rid of homegrown territories completely. Any academy can sign any player from anywhere in the United States and make the academies compete for the talent. Those would be the first two things I would do. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, the only thing I would do is I would set the max cap at forty million. Because Boy, if you look at what a lot of under, yeah, because like a team like Atlanta is spending about that much. That's kind of no, weird. not possible. Forty million in salaries? Okay, maybe not. Maybe I don't know. Maybe the websites I've looked at are not so not correct. The, the upper, it's super hard to find. The upper, so it comes out at the end of every year, you know. And the upper limit from last year, I think, was Toronto with about eighteen million. So that was the highest spenders. It used okay. to be higher for certain teams. It used to be in the early 20s. But nobody's even close to 40. Not even close. Okay. Well, then that, the thing I looked at was completely wrong. Okay. <laughs> Oops. No worries. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, that was my question. No worries, man. Thanks for calling in. Appreciate it. All right, this is going to be, we have three more. So uh, Remaster, the sports nerd, and Vince. Uh, what's up, Remaster? Hey, Pete, how are you? I'm good. What's your name? Uh, Robbie. Hey, Robbie, what's up? Hey, so I just wanted to ask a couple questions about um, our team here. And, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not that old. I'm only 22, but. I still feel like we're kind of a far way away from ever being like a serious World Cup title contender. Would you agree with that? Yes, I'd agree with that. I mean, I feel like, you know, people talk about how this is the most talented team we've ever had, and I do agree with that. Yeah. But we still are, you know, we still got dominated or at the very least severely outplayed by the Netherlands in the round of 16. Sure. It's not like we put up like the most impressive performance. No. So what what would you say when, when would you say is the earliest that we would actually be like a serious contender to win it? Oh, that's tough. Two quick things. One, that team didn't have Balogun or Reyna. So let's keep that in mind. And Greg Tactics really stymied that team. All right. Not saying we would have beat the Netherlands with both of them, but I think we'd have a much better shot with Reyna at the 10 and Balogun up top. But yeah, earliest, I think we need to start developing some world-class players, right? Because how many teams have won the World Cup without world-class players? Like everyone talks about Japan, and I think Japan certainly is making waves with their youth development. Are they developing world-class players, right? Because the world-class players is the difference between being a Morocco and being an Argentina, right? Where you can be plucky underdogs, defend for your life, try to sneak into a semifinal, but you need world-class players, guys who are top 10 in the world in their position at least three or four of them surrounded by a very very good supporting cast right now we don't have any world-class players we have two guys with potential geo if he can stay healthy could be world-class one day balogan could be world-class one day right now neither of them are world-class they're not top 10 in the world in their position um so yeah i think that's the thing we have to do and right now if I look at our youth, I don't see any world-class players potentially coming through the U20s or the U17s. I just don't see any. So I don't think it will be soon. I think what we should do for now is focus on being a team that can regularly be a quarterfinalist and maybe on a lucky day, a semifinalist at the World Cup. And then from there, the missing pieces are we need to be developing world-class players. Where are they going to come from? Our academies have to get better. Our academies have to get better, and we need more kids playing soccer before they get into academies and getting better development from a young age and less coaching from very young ages. Uh, maybe Diego Cochin says BMR. Yeah, very early days for Cochin at 17, but we'll see. Do you think Musa has world-class potential? No. <laughs> I don't see it with Musa. I mean, very good player, elite player. I just When I look at his tools, I don't see a guy who's going to dominate a midfield for the next 10 years. I think he's going to be a solid top five league player. Um, I just don't quite see world class there. But I think the problem with Reina is, is that he's always hurt. I know that's like pretty obvious, yeah. but I mean, it's a serious thing. If he's always going to get hurt, I mean, he's never going to reach his potential. I no. mean, that's happened with so many athletes in so many different sports. Yes. The yeah. only the only thing that that's lucky about this is at least he's not getting any serious injuries. I mean, if he tore his ACL like a couple of times, that would be like awful, obviously. But um, 
he needs to really work on being able to stay healthy and I hope he's able to because he is probably our highest ceiling player. Yeah. I mean, that's the good news is it's two. He's really had two injuries and they're both took a long time. The first one was that hamstring, that hamstring. He it was a reoccurring twice that really. And then this last one was a bone fracture. I mean, that it's it's unfortunate. He was tackled by the fucking Canadian midfielder. Bless his heart. And then he broke a bone. That's more of a contact injury. I'm I'm less worried about that because a bone can break if you're being tackled hard. It's more muscle injuries that would worry me. And that hamstring injury, fingers crossed. We haven't seen a recurrence of it yet since the you know the the spring when he really did recover from it. So fingers crossed for Gio. But you're 100 right. It has he's got to stay healthy, or you know he could be like his dad Claudio, who was a very talented player but injured way too often. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Pete. That's everything I got. No worries, man. Thanks for keeping it brief and punchy. I love it. I love it. Yeah, take care. Take care, man. You have a good one. Remaster. Hang on. Oh, no. Witty Jitty. Witty Jitty, what's up? Witty Jitty, can you hear me? Hello? All right, Witty, I'm going to put you back in the waiting room, and we're going to talk to Vince. Vince, how you doing? Hello? Last couple of guys got no audio. Vince, you there? Nope, nothing from Vince. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? All yeah. right, cool. Uh, Celta Vigo are currently 18th in La Liga, winless in five games, only three points from rock bottom Almeria. So if we see Luca De La Torre get relegated, where would he go? Would he go back to the Netherlands? Could we see him move to a different, like, slim, similar level of league such as the Serie A, or may he just move to a different La Liga club? Or stay. <laughs> you know, I mean, reality is, look, he's got two assists for them this year, and he's been decent to good most games that he's played in. But if they get relegated, he's only been there for two years, right? Um, could another La Liga club or a Serie A club take a chance on him? Maybe. I mean, they got him for super cheap, 1.5 million from Heracles. So even if they mm. were to sell him for double that, three three to five million would not be an uh, unreasonable price for Luca De La Torre. So I think he could move. Um, but let's wait and see. They they were supposedly maybe getting relegated last year too, and then they managed to avoid mm-hmm. it. But also he yeah. could just stay in the second division. I mean, he has a contract with them, right? Mm. But would that by be ideal considering our midfield depth since Lucas like one of the first guys off the bench? No, it wouldn't be ideal if he's playing there. But, you know, if Johnny goes to Betis, now you've got Johnny in the mix too, right? Like, I think our depth is getting better. And then if you have one of our other 10s, like Paxton or Guti or one of those guys breaks through Luna, then, yeah, he could find himself on the outside looking in if he's not playing at a good level. So it's a fair point. All right. Thank you. No worries, man. Is that it? Yep, that's it. Awesome. All right. The sports nerd. Hello? Hi there. How you doing? Quite weak. <laughs> Say that Hi. again. You have to speak uh, up a little. We can't hear you. Hey, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, just try to get as close to your mic as you can. Yeah, one sec. One sec. There you go. Is that better? Yeah, a bit better. Go ahead. Um. Uh, so, what do you think about this whole, like, have they announced where Copa America cities are yet? Because I haven't seen anything yet. Ooh, I'm going to refer you to the chat. Does anybody in the chat know if the Copa America cities are finalized or not? I don't, I didn't see anything. The it's it's taken them an awfully long time. That's how I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, I mean, it's CONCACAF for you. If anybody in the chat knows, we might be wrong, but I haven't heard anything about it. Okay. And also, like, what do you think of uh, Pulley's assist today? Very nice assist. It was like that yeah. uh, It was like that sort of hockey assist that he got in the opening game of the season where he cuts in onto his left and chips it over the back line into the far post, and then Leal, you know, cuts it back to Giroud to score, except this time it was straight to Giroud. Really nice assist. Agreed, agreed. And then uh, last really quick one because I know it's getting late. Uh, Man United, man, what an embarrassment! <laughs> yeah, this it's been to what fifteen years of embarrassment now. Like, <laughs> how long? What's, what's crazy on? is 
What what what's crazy is they're in eighth place in the table. <laughs> yeah. They just look like shit. <laughs> I, think. I know. It's so bad. And then the worst part is is that they probably are just not gonna change a single thing. <laughs> because they're on top of the table. I mean, they're still using Harry Maguire and Johnny Evans and James McTominay and acting like those guys are good enough to make them a top fourteen. They're not. They spend poorly players. It's becoming a Chelsea situation where players Good players go to Manchester United and become actively worse when they get there. It's like a toxic environment almost, you know? Yeah, but then the, what is it like? Why was it? Why is it that like? Because I was thinking like, especially like with Pulisic for, for one, because he's played at a Premier League level before. Like if he like ends up winning a title with AC Milan this year. Yeah. Somehow, which actually, actually I think is pretty, it, it's still a possibility. It's like, possible, but they don't do look like title move? contenders yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, but like, where would he go in the Prem if he was ever at that level? I think he should stay in Italy. I don't think he should be in a rush to go back to the Prem at all. I think he had his time in the Prem, and you know, unless he is crushing it like for two years at Milan, twenty-five goal contributions each season, I would like the Prem might not be for him with his injury history and his, you know, sometimes getting bullied. It's a very physical, very high intensity league, the Premier League, and maybe it just doesn't really suit Pulisic. So. I would be totally fine with him staying Milan in Milan until the World Cup. Awesome. All right. See you. Have a good night, man. No worries, man. Thanks for hopping on. Let's see if Witty Jitty, last one of the night, has fixed the mic issues. Hey, Witty Jitty. Hey. Hey. Hear me? Uh, Super soft, buddy. You're going to have to talk loud and get close to your mic. Okay. Can you hear me right now? That's a bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, all my questions were supposed to be like last last week or something. It was the it was about like the um, Germany U.S. and the Ghana games. Okay. Okay. First of all, are you still living in Chicago? No, no, I live in L.A. I've been in L.A. for the last oh, okay. five and a half years, five okay. years. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Yeah. So basically, I was I just want to talk about how like I feel like because my main sport before I got into soccer was basketball. Okay. And I feel like. Coming into soccer, um, so first of all, thank to you and you and uh, uh, Tack for like introducing the sport so well, and uh, but also, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just leaning in to hear okay. you better. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Basically, one thing that I found that like, I had to switch my mindset when I started watching soccer was the fact that like individuals aren't as important, and so I think that. One thing I'm pretty interested to ask about is how, like, I realize a lot of people were, um, like, criticizing Dest uh, for, like, the, the defensive errors and our defense against Germany. Uh -huh. But I also kind of, like, when I when I uh, see a lot of good defenses, usually there aren't a lot of individual players that are, like, complimented. Usually it's like, oh, the, their defense is very well organized. And so I feel like... I feel like this is a little is a little bit judged unfairly because I feel like defenses should be judged as a whole and not individually. Do you agree with my my assessment? I think that it's fair to say that having a well organized defense is definitely a group activity, right? But within that group activity of an organized solid defense, there are individual responsibilities. And I think for Des, sometimes his ability to react quickly to like the game is getting faster mm -hmm. and faster every year the speed of play, your reaction speed and your ability to recognize danger and to make decisions quickly and make the right decisions is getting more and more important. And so while it is a group game and a group activity defending, within that you have individual responsibilities. You cannot switch off and let your man walk into the far post. You cannot, you know, be ha half second too slow to drop back in transition. Those are parts of his job. So I do actually agree with you especially for the U S I think he's judged a little harshly. Yeah. I don't think Dest is it's again, I've said this many times, but I don't think it's a lack of ability. I think it's a mental thing with Dest. I just think he has moments where he switches off and in the modern game at a high level, you'll get killed for that. And against the best teams mm -hmm. like Arsenal, he does. But I, other than that, I don't think he's actually a bad defender. I think it's more of a mental lapse issue that I hope he can get over one day. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Like, I feel kind of weird because the I don't. I know people criticize Burhalter, but I've never heard people criticize him for his like defense. Because I always felt like, like for example, like 
Do you remember the Greek team in 2004 that won the Euros? Yes. And I don't know any a single player except for maybe one of their like midfielders that's kind of famous. All the other ones I didn't I don't know a single one of them. Yeah. And it's pretty much because yeah. of their coach that they have a very good they organize their defense very well. Yeah. And I just watching this US team, sometimes I feel like their defense isn't organized that well. Do you agree with me? Yeah, no, I would agree. With I think that, that especially against good opponents. Yeah. But again, it's it's a lack of flexibility, you know, and you you have your fullbacks yeah. very high. It's it, our defending is a byproduct of the way we attack. You know, the way he wants his fullbacks to get really high up the field, the way Adams goes lunging in high up the field to try and win the ball, and then if you don't win the pressing or you don't win those individual duels and you turn over the ball, now we're really caught on the back foot. So you can't look, in my opinion, at defending and attacking as isolated things. You have to look at them as, you know, codependent on each other. Mm -hmm. How you attack is going to definitely dictate how you defend. What Greg is doing, and really this should be, you know, duh, it's it's not even on Greg. It's like we have the players now to be an attacking team with to, to want to keep the ball. But Greg is one way to do that. And he won't change it up when we play a big team. We tried to attack the Netherlands the same way we tried to attack Iran, and it was foolish. It was foolhardy. It was naive. I think yeah. we like we could be a team that against lesser teams and teams similar to us, we want to attack and we want to have the ball. But against the bigger teams, we pull a Morocco. I mean, I know you mentioned Greece, but I'm also mentioning Morocco. Like people forget they yeah. beat Spain and Portugal by defending for their lives and getting quick transitions. That should be a part of our arsenal too that we should be developing between now and 2026. Do I trust Greg to do that? Probably not because he's a stubborn, naive yeah. man with a very limited capacity for change or growth. Hmm. Okay. And the that's a really good answer. Um, let me see. Last question. Uh, I don't know. Personally, looking at the uh, common bowl right now, I feel like outside of Argentina, I feel like they're not that strong, like especially compared to like previous like previous generations of like common bowl teams. Especially like when we look at Brazil right now, they're not. I don't think they're doing that well. And even outside Brazil and Argentina, there aren't any teams I look at and I feel like they're like extremely dominant or like could like we would be like severe underdogs against. What do you think about the current common bowl situation? I feel yeah, like it's I mean, I think we would be team. underdogs to Brazil and Argentina for sheer talent alone. And I think we would be underdogs for your on Uruguay, partially because of talent, yeah. but also partially yeah. because of El Loco, right? Oh, the coach. Sure. And, oh. you know, Bielsa has proven that he knows, at least in the short term, how to make teams very difficult to play against. So those three, we would be the underdogs. I think we would be, talent-wise, we're comparable to Colombia and mm. Ecuador. And when I say, say comparable, I don't mean as good, because I know some people are going to freak out about this. But the talent gap is not big enough to necessarily call us underdogs. I think there's a similar level of talent. And if we can beat them, you know, we have to show that we can outwit them tactically and get results when it matters. And that's when what Copa America, I think, will show us. Yeah. Yeah. And talk about Bielsa. That makes me think about, like, pressing a lot. Do What do you think about the US MNT? Should we become, a, like... Do you like what Greg is doing now in terms of pressing? Do you think that we should be more of a because against like teams like Germany? Do we th do you think we should bunker more, or should we continue being like a high press team? I think being a pressing team uh, is something that we should have in the arsenal, but not something that we should rely on. Right? I think if you okay. have terrible technical te players and they're all athletes and runners, then you really try to become a pressing team. Now, credit to Bielsa, he takes all kinds of players, very technical players, and he gets them to yeah. buy into his system. And he gets them to buy in. He convinces yeah. them, at least in the short term, that it can be very successful. And it can. The problem with Bielsa is that everywhere he goes, you see this, after about two to three years, the players just break down because it's so fucking intense yeah. for so long. Yeah. So I think pressing is a good tool to have in the arsenal. But I think if you really want to get results, you need to be able to adapt and be flexible. I don't mind being a bunkering team if we face Argentina. Because I think that gives us our best chance at winning. And let's face it, mm. with Balogun's speed and Gio's ability to play a through ball and Pulisic's ability in transition and Wea's ability in transition, we have guys who could be very, very dangerous in transition. So I don't mm. mind us 
being a bunker team against the top teams in the world if it's going to help us get a result. And a result in a World Cup is the difference between a second round and a quarterfinal or a quarterfinal and a semifinal. So the result is yeah. everything. I think we need to be versatile. And I think pressing is great. It's one of the things in the arsenal. I don't think we should ever rely on it as our thing. Yeah, that's interesting. So you, you would, you, you're the type that would believe that winning is more important than the way you play. At and at a World winning. Cup level in a knockout round, yes, right. If you're facing okay. Trinidad and Tobago or even Canada in a Gold Cup, no, I think that we you are the if you are the better team, then the way you play absolutely matters, right? So mm. if we play Argentina, you know, back and forth, and we and we lose three one to Argentina, eh, what have we accomplished? We could go toe to toe with them. That gets you nothing. But if we're playing Argentina yeah. in a Copa America semifinal and we bunker and we get a 93rd minute goal from Balogun because Gio found him in transition, now we have a win and we're in a Copa America final. So yeah, in that context, yeah. winning is more important. Yeah. But of course, if you're playing teams worse than you, then definitely how you play matters. Yeah, I agree. And you, I think that that kind of mentality, you can kind of see in the Argentinian team too, because they don't really play like, like if you look at the possession numbers, they they're on a high possession team. It's kind of like 50, 50 most of the time. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. I think this Argentina team. Well, also you want Argentina win. when they play Brazil, what do they do? They bunker. Yeah. Like in that Copa America final, what did they do? They said, okay, Brazil, you have the ball. Yeah. So if, you think if Argentina can do it, it, why are we above it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've been such a fan of your uh, channel for a long time. So. No worries, Keep man. Going. Thank you so much for calling in. Yeah. Woo! Guys, we almost did two hours here. Jeff Carey, sorry, no FaceTiming, buddy, but you can hop on the Discord. Just keep the spiciness to yourself. We have 160-odd people. Guys, smash the like button before you leave so other people can find the stream. Do you think Turner gets benched after today? I think that would be harsh after one mistake. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, I don't I don't think he gets benched after one mistake, but if he makes one or two more that cost them a game, then perhaps. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging. This was fun. My voice is going here. Thanks to everybody who called in. Sorry if you weren't able to get all your questions in, but we got to keep it moving. Got to keep it punchy. Have a great night, guys. Enjoy your Sunday. Happy Halloween on Tuesday. Probably going to have a video out Wednesday or Thursday. 